Hello everyone and welcome to this review of La Resistance from the Iron Workshop. Now, as some of you may know, I was quite skeptical about this uh, DLC from the get-go, so I didn't have high expectations. And I have to say that some of my skepticism was uh, justified. And I'm going to explain why in this review. I'm going to mention the good stuff and also the bad stuff. Now, spoiler. Unfortunately, the list of the not-so-good stuff is longer than the good list. So, um, hopefully that will change in the future, but that's how things stand at the moment. And with that said, let's get to the review. Okay, so uh, Largest Distance is the fourth uh, DLC for Hard to Mind 4. Its main concepts are espionage, infiltration and resistance. And we will talk about uh, these features and how well uh, they are implemented in the game. And also, La Resistance includes three new focus trees for Portugal, Spain and France. And uh, for those of you who have uh, watched this channel before, you might be familiar that my stance on uh, focus trees is that no matter how good they are, I don't think they should be part of DLCs, or at the very least, they should have their own DLCs, which are much cheaper. I would say, for example, something like $5 for a focus tree per country. And uh, right now, I feel as though the high price that I paid for a large distance uh, was also paying for the focus trees. And I'll tell you the truth, I was fine playing Hard Time 4 without Portugal, Spain or France having their focus trees. Now sure, it makes the game more fun now that they do, but it's much nicer when I have a choice if I want them to have their focus trees. Enough of me ranting about focus trees, let's talk about the good stuff. Now a couple of good things have come with uh, this expansion. Although, to be honest, uh, I think that a lot of it has to do with the patch and not the DLC, uh, which we didn't pay for. So thank you, Paradox. Thank you for updating the game and improving it with the patch. Uh, but uh, yeah, those things have definitely made the game uh, more pleasant. And here they are. First of all, we have a couple of interface changes in the game. Um, the first one being that you can now uh, turn decisions off uh, with a single click, so you don't have to go, uh, for, uh, you don't have to click every decision individually in order to turn off the notification for it. Unfortunately, it doesn't fix another issue, which I will talk about towards the end of this review. Uh, also, we have uh, zooming in on focuses and filtering some focuses as well. Uh, which is very nice because, uh, as we all know, Paradox have uh, taken inspiration from modders and have decided to make their focus trees as gigantic as possible. Uh, so now you have to filter all of that information, which is presented in a very uh, sometimes difficult way to understand. So you cannot focus these, uh, sorry, <laughs> you cannot filter these. Uh, unfortunately, there is no filter which I actually expected to have, which just shows you which focuses you can take. Uh, because right now that distinction isn't always very clear, especially in very large focus trees. It would be nice if we could have a filter that would just uh, make the focuses that you can take dark without having any other filter on, right? Because I don't care if the particular focus is a political one or a military one, I just want to know if I can take it. So if I could have it dark, that would be much nicer. And uh, another good thing uh, which is worth mentioning is that uh, there is major work uh, under the hood done and especially when it comes to modding. Now this channel is devoted to modding Heart of Iron 4. Uh, I myself am a modder, I create mods for the game. So uh, there are a lot of improvements in that area and uh, this is definitely one point uh, for Paradox. It's not something that we can take for granted. Not all companies provide uh, their communities with such ex extensive modding support. And uh, with this expansion we get some really awesome stuff. So thank you Paradox very much 
I have no doubt that the modding community is going to make um, great mods uh, from all the tools and improvements that we were given. And now, unfortunately, I have to talk about some of the bad stuff. So, uh, the first thing is that the new interface aren't amazing. The new interfaces that you get uh, for occupation, uh, for uh, the espionage, and some of them really lack in things that seem quite obvious, like uh, options to filter, since uh, sometimes you find yourself looking at a lot of information and you just want to filter some of it out. And some of these are just missing these basic filters that I really expected to have, and for some reason they're not there. Uh, I will talk about these uh, separately uh, as we continue this review and I will explain explain exactly what I mean. Uh, now, it's unfortunate because uh, with things that seem to be so obvious, it's kind of weird that Paradox don't seem to be learning from their previous experience. Um, I mean, they are developing a lot of these games uh, and the games uh, are constantly being improved, their interfaces as well. So it seems kind of strange that sometimes they leave these things out uh, that seem to be quite obvious. Um, not sure why that's happening, but as we talk about it uh, in a more particular way, uh, you'll see what I mean. And hopefully these things will be uh, resolved uh, with future updates to the game. Now, another thing uh, is that the new mechanics are underwhelming and they do not justify the effort and time that you put into them. Especially with espionage, um, you do all of these missions, uh, yeah, on paper they sound great, uh, they sound uh, very interesting and very, you know, like, involving, things like that, you now have portraits. Uh, one thing that you have to understand that Paradox did here, I mean, we had an espionage system in Hearts Fire 3. Now, obviously it wasn't as in-depth as this one. But it was more uh, interfaces and numbers and this is a trend that Paradox are following and it's probably a good trend, uh, this is a positive change. Uh, they're turning uh, the numbers into people, into objects that we can relate to, right? So now instead of numbers you have these spies, they have their own traits, they have their portraits. So that's fine and you, you know, you want to get invested in these spies, the things that they do. But that's hard to do, first of all, because there are some issues with the spies themselves, with the mechanics that I will talk about. The other one is that the rewards that you get from these missions, you don't really feel like anything happened. After you complete a mission, uh, there's a small tooltip that tells you, yeah, you got this but you don't really feel like you've achieved anything. And that's really setting the system to failure because if you invest all that time and you don't see the payoff, chances are you will not use the system. And uh, to be honest, in one of my games uh, when I played Portugal, I did not engage with the new systems much at all. I actually played like pre Lars Estan's game. Um, just interacting with the new focuses for Portugal. Um, so hopefully this is something that will definitely be fixed with patches, with balancing and things like that, uh, because probably you can fix that. Another thing um, is that it's not really clear if the AI is using the new systems at all. Um, I play the game as Portugal, as Spain and as the United States. And at no point did I feel that I was under some kind of a threat or that the enemy spies were causing me uh, any trouble. Now, it's quite possible that uh, the spies are mostly being used by major nations. And since I didn't exactly uh, engage major nations, unless you consider, let's say, Japan versus, versus the United States, I did not feel that the AI is using the new systems at all or doing anything to, uh, to its benefit to uh, improve its situation. Uh, so that's a shame. But this could be tied to the previous point that I made, that maybe the AI is using it, 
but because the effects or the payoffs are so negligible, uh, you don't really feel it. So hopefully that will be resolved as well. And the last thing uh, that I would like to mention is that um, Hearts of Iron is really starting to show its core problems, which seem to be getting worse. And as, as the game gets more and more content, these problems uh, are actually starting to get more and more annoying. And what I mean exactly by that, uh, you will see by the end of this video where I will talk about that. Um, and hopefully Paradox will do something about this uh, because uh, these will probably require some thinking about how to solve them. Okay, so that's uh, broad strokes about what's wrong uh, with the game and the expansion so far. Now I'm going to go into detail about uh, the two new systems, the occupation system and the SPNR system. Okay, so uh, the first uh, issue that I have with the new occupation system is this interface here, Occupy Territories, which you can access through your country screen by clicking on Occupy Territories. Now, um, I have to say this uh, interface uh, seems like something that you might expect from uh, modders. Um, really, the amount of information and the way that it's laid in here, laid out, um, it's... Uh, I don't know what to say. It's, it's, it's troubling. <laughs> I think that's the best description I can give for it. Because, first of all, you have uh, these panels here for each country. But as you can see, uh, because of the color scheme, it's sometimes hard to tell uh, which country exactly you're talking about. So um, this can get a little bit irritating for, and you don't even have like these filters for dif different uh, regions. And since this system is supposed to be uh, quite a lot about uh, co colonies um, or let's say occupation in distant places, if for example you're the United States and you're occupying Italy, uh, then it would make sense that you would be able to filter these things by their location. Now you do have some filters here, uh, we just filter them by uh, their modifiers, but not by their location. And that really uh, makes things more difficult. Another thing is that you have these icons here for the modifiers, now, I guess these icons aren't supposed to be distinguishable because I can't really tell them apart uh, with them being so small. And uh, if you can't tell them apart, it's really hard to uh, know what is it exactly uh, that you are losing uh, when your collaboration or compliance goes down below this icon. Also, these icons, as you can see, are overlapping the progress, the progress bar here. I'm not sure why. Uh, was there no way to like put them just a bit lower than that and create like a line that will tell you where this modifier stops uh, having its effect? I don't know, this is very weird. Uh, then you have this number here, which is stuck uh, on top of icons and things like that. Really, I, I, I don't know who thought that this design is something that you can just release and that people will be happy with it. Uh, I'm quite disappointed because the reason that I'm disappointed is not because, you know, Paradox is an indie studio, it's their first game, uh, they're still trying things, they're learning. I'm disappointed because Paradox have already done these things in other games and they have done them well. Uh, what happened? Why suddenly in here are we getting these awkward interfaces that we can't really uh, maneuver and uh, understand properly? Um, I really don't know what was the design philosophy behind this, uh, but that's the way it is. Hopefully it will be uh, fixed in a future patch 
Now, um, another thing which is a problem with this system is that um, it doesn't seem to have much an effect on your gameplay. So when I was playing my Portugal game, uh, I kept the settings as they are for most of the game and uh, nothing really happened. I mean, when you put everything on civilian oversight, uh, compliance levels stay as they are. Uh, I didn't have any events or focuses that changed anything in here drastically. Uh, so, unfortunately, up until this point, I don't really know what happens when resistance goes too high uh, because I didn't experience it yet. Um, so, apparently, we can have a rebellion um, and hopefully it's not just some modifier, but hopefully a country is supposed to break away and will try to fight for its independence. Um, Maybe it was mentioned in the video uh, diaries or in some of the dev diaries, uh, but I must have missed uh, those diaries, so I don't really know what happens. My point is that uh, it seems that uh, in large, this whole system can be ignored. You don't really have to interact with it. You can just keep the settings as they are and you'll probably do fine. Uh, so it's a bit of a shame because you, you can see that a lot of work was put into this and uh, it can really uh, have a, a nice uh, effect on your gameplay and uh, force you to make some hard decisions uh, but and in its current state it doesn't do that uh, so the system doesn't seem to be working as intended um, and that's a shame as I said, hopefully uh, in a future update, uh, this whole thing uh, will work much better. Now let us talk about the espionage system. Now, the first thing that I want to say about it is that uh, when you're engaged in some pretty serious fighting, you probably won't really have time for this whole system uh, because it does require quite a bit of micromanagement and uh, when the fate of your country or uh, you losing the war uh, stands on you managing uh, both your equipment and all the things that you had to manage up until this point the last thing that you're going to have on your mind is if some spy got captured and uh, you having to now rescue him uh, so the whole espionage system uh, doesn't seem to be very relevant to nations who are at war or let's say nations who are in a very significant war uh, for example if you're the United States and your immediate uh, country your immediate uh, land isn't threatened uh, then yeah you might be able to interact with the system but if you're the Soviet Union I doubt you will be worried about spies when you have German troops approaching Moscow and uh, this is a good segue to the first issue with the espionage system, is the balance. Uh, now the system isn't very balanced and I did talk about it at the beginning of the video, meaning that uh, while you have uh, a lot of these missions here that you can do, um, the rewards that you get for these missions are um, nah, not great. Uh, they're not re really rewarding and uh, you actually feel like you wasted your time in many cases uh, Because you did put a lot of effort because for example if you want to do a good mission uh, You will first need to send your agent to a country like so uh, So you click on an agent you then go to the country You click on build a network and it stops it starts going up and as soon as it reaches a certain percentage uh, it unlocks missions that you can do uh, in the country uh, for example here i have as you see all of these missions in japan um, so these things take quite a bit of time also the upgrades uh, for uh, this system here uh, also take quite a bit of time and uh, resources now obviously if you're a country like the United States 
uh, five civilian uh, five civilian factories is not a big deal, but for smaller nations uh, that can really uh, be a burden, and it. It's nice if that burden would have a significant payoff, which right now it doesn't. Another thing is the cryptology, where you can uh, decrypt codes of another country. And uh, for doing that, as you can see here, it takes a lot of days. And this is even after I got quite a bit of upgrades here. Uh, it still takes quite a bit of days to do this. And after you have done all of that, after you've spent all of these days uh, decrypting, um, you get uh, some nice bonuses, but they only last for 30 days. I'm not sure it's worth it. And I think that at the very least, they should probably extend the amount of days that you get the bonus. Something like, let's say, 90, 90 days. Because bonuses for just one month, that's nothing. Uh, it's really not worth the effort, the time, uh, so I don't really see the point of doing this uh, or even uh, paying attention to it, right? Spending your attention on that as opposed to something else which might give you uh, more benefits in the long run. Okay, now let's talk about the amount of agents that each country gets. Now here as the United States, you see that I have quite a bit of agents and that's cool, that's awesome. Uh, the thing is that uh, I only got past two agents once I became the spy master for my faction. Uh, up until that point, the United States of America had only two spies available to it. Only two spies. No matter how many upgrades uh, you have for your intelligence agency. No matter how many civilian factories you have. No matter the size of your country, of your economy, nothing, nothing changes the amount of agents that you have. So the United States of America gets the same amount of spies as a country like Bhutan. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's not underwhelming at all. And I don't really understand what was the thinking behind this. Uh, I mean, okay. Sure, you need some payoff for becoming the Spy Master, but why is it only two? I mean, let's say that a Spy Master can have 20 spies, but any country before that should probably have at least five. You can't really do anything with two spies, uh, and the reason for that are the missions. If you look here at the operations, you will see that for most of them you will need at least to spies. So, for example, if you are busy uh, building a network in Japan, just to do some damage in Japan, but you also want to keep an eye out on Mexico or Germany or any other country, um, you can't because once you have a mission available, you're going to have your force to take that spy from another country and move him over to do the operation with the spy in the country that he wasn't even working in. It really doesn't make any sense. And also all of these missions, as you, as you, as you can see, they require at least two spies. Why? I mean, the limit is two spies. Why each mission requires two spies? I'm confused, really. I'm just, I'm just confused. I really don't know uh, what's the thought process here. How has has any balancing gone into the works here? Um, was this fun for the developers when they were playing it? Because you have to take into consideration that uh, I was playing uh, single player games. In multiplayer, where you often have to face off several players working against you, will you really be able to do that with these limitations? Probably not. Is it a recipe for a lot of frustration? Yes. Uh, and I don't know, did the developers not have these frustrations when they were developing and testing the, these things? Uh, so very strange decisions all across uh, this whole system. And unfortunately, the list uh, doesn't end there. Because when I mentioned uh, micromanagement, 
First of all, quite often, uh, some of your spies will be kicked back to your home country and they will appear here, uh, right above your nation's capital, uh, with no explanation or any seemingly uh, valid reason. Uh, you assign them to a mission or you assign them to build a network and after you take a look after some time, they are back in your capital. Not sure why. Uh, okay, uh, maybe that's a glitch, maybe that's a bug, uh, maybe there's supposed to be an event to pop up and let you know why the spy was kicked back to your country after you sent him uh, to work on another country. Um, now, that's one case. Another case is that after uh, each mission that your spy finishes in a country, for example here you see that uh, I have spies doing the infiltrate uh, army mission. After this mission is over and the spy has completed his objective, uh, he is returned back to the home country and you have to reassign him back uh, see this uh, nice lady here. Uh, I have to reassign her back now to Germany and she has to build the spy network from zero. Again, things that don't really make sense. I mean, she was already in the country. She carried out an operation. She obviously already has connections in the country. Um, why does she have to rebuild the whole network from scratch, uh, it just doesn't make sense. Why do I have to relocate her back to the country where she was working in? Uh, this micromanagement is really unnecessary uh, and it just causes quite a lot of frustration and I don't understand why it's implemented that way. And uh, now my last complaint uh, with the intelligence agency um, interface is that you don't really have a proper way to filter these missions. As you can see here, there's quite a long uh, scroll bar and um, you have this flag, you have this small flag here to indicate uh, in which country you can do uh, each of these missions. But when you have these many spies and you have them in a lot of countries, it becomes really well, annoying uh, to continue to scroll just to find the right mission uh, for the country that you want the operation to be done in. So we need two very simple things here. First of all, we need a country filter. I want to know uh, in which country I have which spies and which missions they can do in that country. Uh, the second one is we need a filter for the types of missions. Uh, why am I being shown all of these missions if I just want to see very specific missions for all the countries? Let's say that I want to infiltrate uh, the army of 10 countries that I have spies in. So I should be able to get that information easily. And right now you don't. You have to do a lot of scrolling, you have to do a lot of searching for very basic information and again the reason that I am so upset with this is because Paradox know better. They're not new to this, they know how to do these things properly or at least they should know because they have done similar things with other systems, with other games quite well. So I, I don't understand was this for lack of time it's strange, it's really strange and it causes a lot of frustration with the, with the system which, uh, as I already said, is having significant balance issues and payoff problems. So when you have to deal with faulty interfaces on top of that, it can really put you off these systems and that is a shame. Okay, so these are my biggest issues with the two major systems introduced in La Resistance. Now, the good news is that most of this stuff can be fixed by patches and by balancing updates. So hopefully we will see these coming in the next few weeks and months. These systems do have a potential to be very fun and very engaging and hopefully much more easier to navigate to understand. So they do have great potential, it's just that the current execution is a bit lacking. 
Now, what I'm going to talk about now at the end of this video are problems which probably can be resolved with just one patch, but require quite a bit of uh, thought process uh, to understand how to fix these issues. And first of all, let me show you this very fun little thing. Now, uh, some of you or probably most of you have noticed that Paradox have updated these icons here. Now, you may ask yourself why did they do that? Uh, because they haven't updated these icons for any of the other uh, expansions. And the reason is that I suspect that they want to have more information displayed in these icons. And that is great, uh, because when you can get access to information without opening the menu, that's great. That is something that was implemented in Victoria 2 very well. And uh, while Victoria 2 had its issues, the upper panel showed quite a bit of information which you could access at a glance without having to click on too many buttons or to get into menus. So that was very nice. So the updated icons are uh, a welcome addition, but they have uh, not solved core issue which is uh, just over here, if you uh, look closely. This is the list of decisions that are available to me. A lot of these uh, are decisions that are placed solely on the map. So quite honestly, I don't think they should be on this list, but they are uh, because this list is supposed to list all the decisions that you can take, either if they are in the interface or if they are on the map. But uh, yeah, that is the current state of this uh, feature, which is supposed to help you uh, get information faster. But when I look at it, I'm not feeling like I'm getting information any faster. In fact, I, f I feel like I want to die inside. Hmm. So, so that is one issue that Paradox are really going to have to think hard about because this looks very, very bad and uh, it's going to get worse. It's really going to get worse. And hopefully somebody at the development uh, team at Paradox uh, is worried as I am about this because this cannot go on. Uh, and obviously we also have it in here. Uh, we need some more filters up here to really hide some of this information uh, because if this keeps going, the decisions and events panel is going to get really bad. For any of you who might be thinking that, wow, this guy is a really, is a real Paradox hater. Well, I'm not. I really love Paradox. I love the games that they make. I really care about the games that they make. I think that they're a very unique company. I really, uh, at this point, I really envy the players of Stellaris and Europa Universalis two games that are really getting very significant change to their core mechanics. Hopefully Paradox will find the courage or the means to do similar changes in Hearts of Iron 4 to fix some really core issues with the game as they do in Stellaris and Europa and Stellaris 4, which will make the game just better. And that's it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this uh, review. Uh, let me know in the comments if you agree, if you disagree. So thank you again all for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, please hit that like button and subscribe. It helps the channel grow. Check out these other videos on the Iron Workshop that you might enjoy as well. Please consider supporting the Iron Workshop on Patreon. This will allow the channel to grow and become even better. Thank you.